So the Corsair 1 is back and it is bigger than ever. Well, actually, no, it's the same size as it was before, but now it has been updated for 2022 with the latest and greatest hardware. And that includes an Intel i9 CPU and an RTX 3080 Ti. The big question then really is, can a chassis this compact really deal with such high-end components? That's what we're gonna find out in this review. Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru and today we are checking out the Corsair 1 i300. So the Corsair 1 has been around for a few years now but this is the latest model that was announced back at CES and it's packing an Intel i9-12900K, an RTX 3080 Ti, 64GB of DDR5 memory and a 2TB SSD. In this video then, we are going to put the Corsair 1 through its paces and even compare it to a full-size desktop so you know exactly what level of performance Corsair can offer in this compact chassis. Speaking of the chassis, the Corsair 1 may have been around for a few years now, but I still think it remains a stylish and visually unique small form factor gaming PC. It's very well built with aluminium side panels that have a lovely black finish and there's also two RGB LED strips that run down the front of the unit and you can configure these to your liking in the IQ software. Both side panels of the Corsair 1 do feature triangular cutouts to allow for some ventilation, but it's also good to see a very healthy selection of ports. The front panel, for instance, has two USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports as well as a USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-C as well as an audio jack and being on the front those are all easily accessible. And then round the back there are a ton of options here too including six full-size USB Type-A ports, there's even two Thunderbolt 4 ports as well as 7.1 audio jacks, 2.5G Ethernet and Wi-Fi 6E antennae. The graphics card then provides three DisplayPort 1.4 as well as one HDMI 2.1. At the top of the unit we can see this grill section and you can just about make out a single fan directly beneath this. This is actually the only case fan in the entire system as the Corsair 1 uses what Corsair calls its convection assisted liquid cooling system. If you've seen other Corsair 1 systems in the past then this hasn't really changed but basically what Corsair is doing is there's two closed loop liquid coolers one on the CPU and one on the GPU, with only a single fan in the roof, which draws cool air through the system and exhausts it out the top. We have seen this system work to great effect in the past when we've reviewed prior generations of the Corsair 1, but of course with an i9 and 3080 Ti, thermals are going to be a focus of our review later on in this video. To access the internals of the PC then, a small button is pushed on the back of the machine and that releases the top fan. This is a Corsair ML140 unit, although Corsair has told us they have tweaked the RPM range to make it just a bit more suitable for the Corsair 1, though in theory it would be possible to swap this out for any 140mm fan that you wish. Once that fan is out of the way then, four small screws can be removed from the chassis and these release the side panels, which can actually be hinged open so you can access the internals. As viewed from the front of the machine, the left-hand side of the system houses the motherboard and PSU, while the graphics card is on the right-hand side of the unit, connected via a riser cable. Speaking of the motherboard then, Corsair is actually pretty vague in the spec sheet as they only specify the motherboard to be Z690, but actually we found it is the MSI MEG Z690i Unifier, which is actually a pretty high-end mini ITX motherboard. Our model also has 64 gigabytes of DDR5 memory, and that's two 32 gigabyte sticks. I was a little bit disappointed to see Corsair is using bare green PCB modules here, so there's no Vengeance LPX heat spreaders, for instance, but then again, once the system is closed, you can't see the internals anyway, so it's not really a big deal. Just below the CPU block then on the motherboard, we can see a small heatsink which is covering up the two terabyte NVMe SSD. Now I had assumed that this would be from Corsair's MP600 lineup, 
but actually diving into HW info reveals that this SSD is a Samsung PM9A1. Now I do test SSD speeds later on in this review and spoiler alert, they are absolutely fine. I just found it a little bit strange that Corsair wasn't using one of their own SSDs in the Corsair 1 system. So I reached out and asked them about this and they basically told me it all comes down to what is in stock at the time of manufacture. But like I said, the PM9A1 is a perfectly fine Gen 4 SSD, so I don't have any issues with this. Below the motherboard area then, we can note the PSU, which is a 750 watt Corsair SF750, which is 80 plus platinum certified. We have tested this one in the past and it is a very high quality unit. It gave me absolutely zero issues during all of my testing with the Corsair One. And I also like the fact that Corsair has put in the effort and tried to keep the cables as tidy as possible. Even though you can't see the internals, it does make them that bit easier to access when you've opened up the system. Moving on then to the right hand side of the Corsair One, here we can find the graphics and Corsair is using a PCIe 4.0 riser card to enable the GPU to be mounted separately from the CPU. And of course we can see it has been vertically mounted as well. We can also see that Corsair is using a very custom cooling setup for the 3080 Ti. The GPU itself is liquid cooled, but we can note the use of a few copper heat pipes as well as two heat sinks, one on the VRM and one on the memory, and these are actively cooled with 80mm fans. It's also worth noting that this 3080 Ti has been left at reference clocks, so that's 1665 MHz boost, and it's also been left at the default power limit of 350 watts. On the topic of cooling, it's also worth touching on the two radiators used to cool the CPU and the GPU. Both measure 20.4 millimeters thick and are 148 millimeters across, but the CPU radiator is shorter with a length of 200 millimeters compared to 272 millimeters in length for the GPU radiator. The GPU is the higher power of the two components, so this does make sense. Plus, this CPU radiator needs to be a bit shorter to allow fresh air to be drawn in by the power supply. Overall then, from a technical perspective, I have to say it is highly impressive what Corsair has managed to do with this system. And the Corsair one is certainly one of a kind, if you excuse the absolutely terrible pun. The only real problem I have in terms of the hardware and the overall setup comes down to upgradability as this seems tricky at best and almost impossible at worst. The CPU side definitely seems less complicated although with an i9-12900K I would say this will keep you happy for years especially if you're gaming at 4K. It's the GPU upgrading though which I think really could be the problem area. After all, upgrading a PC is basically one of the key selling points to buying a gaming PC in the first place. Now, it is technically possible to swap out the graphics card as it is using a standard PCIe X16 slot. However, we do have to factor in the bespoke cooling hardware, which is almost certainly not going to fit on a next generation graphics card. Even if you just pull all of that out and just stick in an air cool card, not only are you going to be highly space constrained, but you're also more than likely going to be power and thermally constrained as well, as all of the rumors are suggesting next generation graphics cards are going to draw a ton of juice. Moving on to the testing side of things now though, I want to start by first talking about the comparisons we are going to use against the Corsair One in this review. I decided to pit the Corsair One i300 head to head with the Kitgiru GPU test system which is powered by MSI. Both are based on the Z690 platform and use a 12900K. Both have fast DDR5 memory and 2TB NVMe SSDs. And in the Kitgiru test system we did install an RTX 3080 Ti Founders Edition to make it a fair test. The key difference is of course that our test system is a mid tower chassis with an ATX motherboard so we can see exactly how performance varies from the mini ITX Corsair 1 when compared to a traditional desktop. The final thing to discuss then before getting on with testing is the BIOS situation as here 
we had a little bit of fun and games. So I noticed in Corsair's reviewer's guide that they point out that the i9-12900K has been limited to 165 watts for the long duration and 175 watts for the short duration, which is set at two seconds. In my initial testing, however, the CPU was drawing a consistent 180 watts when stressed in Cinebench R23. Now I did check this with Corsair and they told me the 165 watt figure is correct. It wasn't a typo or anything like that. So that left me a little bit confused, especially as I've actually seen a few other reviews of this system who also mentioned the 180 watt power figure. As it turns out, my model was running an older BIOS, specifically EZD29IZ1.1C3. Despite being reset to optimized defaults, the CPU section in the BIOS clearly shows 180 watts long duration power limit rising to 200 watts for the short duration. It's also important to note that this BIOS is dated to 15th of October 2021, almost three months before the i300 was announced at CES 2022. Updating to the latest BIOS then, which is EZD29IZ1.1C5 instead of .1C3, this resulted in the long duration power limit now showing as 165 watts, which now matches with the figure in Corsair's reviewer's guide. This BIOS is the latest one and is the one you can download through Corsair's website. However, it is still only dated to December 2021, so it's not especially recent by modern standards. Based on this, we can only assume that review samples were shipped out with a pre-release BIOS. Perhaps at the time these systems were manufactured, Corsair was still experimenting with how much power draw they wanted to get away with, but for the final retail versions, they decided to pull it back to 165 watts. I did also check with Corsair and they told us that all retail versions of the Corsair 1 will ship with the .1C5 BIOS. Whatever the case may be, this definitely gave us an interesting angle to take with our testing. So where applicable, today you're actually going to see two results for the Corsair 1 on our charts. The first was when we tested with the original BIOS with the CPU power limit set to 180 watts. And then the second is when we retested with the updated, the most recent BIOS, where the CPU power limit is now set at 165 watts. The key difference we observe between those two BIOS is that for all core loads using the 180 watt BIOS, the i9-12900K would operate at 4.5 to 4.6 gigahertz on the P-Cores. Switching to the correct 165 watt BIOS, however, saw the P-Cores run a bit slower at between 4.3 and 4.4 gigahertz, so they dropped back about 200 megahertz. For reference, the i9 in our GPU test system, which is not power limited at all, that drew 270 watts on auto settings and easily maintained 4.9 gigahertz on the P-Cores under load. Getting into the testing then, we will start with Blender 3.1.0. This is an intensive all-core CPU load, so as expected, the Corsair 1 using the 165 watt BIOS is slower than when we tested with the 180 watt power limit, though admittedly only by a couple of percent. The i9 in our GPU test system, however, is comfortably faster as it can maintain its all-core turbo at a higher clock speed than the Corsair 1. The same trend can also be observed in Cinebench R23. The Corsair 1 limited to 165 watts is about 900 points behind the same system but with the 180 watt power limit, and that's a difference of 3%. As expected, our own test system is faster still. Interestingly, however, the single core results are basically the same for all three configurations tested. And that's because the i9 is not power limited at 165 watts when only utilizing a single thread. And we observed all three systems hitting 5.1 gigahertz on that thread in question. That may also partly explain the strange results we see in the 3D Mark Times by CPU Benchmark. For reasons I just cannot fathom, the Corsair 1 with the power limit at 180 watts is actually outperforming our GPU test system by a couple hundred points. I even spoke to Mr. Leo Waldock about this, who is our resident Intel expert, and he told me that he has also seen some questionable behavior 
when testing CPUs in TimeSpy with no real explanation for the performance differences, so perhaps it's not the best CPU benchmark to use. In any case, the results are still all very close together, we're only talking minor differences. Thankfully, TimeSpy as a GPU test, however, has never given me any problems, and we can see the RTX 3080 Ti Founders Edition is outperforming Corsair's liquid cool GPU by about 3%. Moving on though, it's interesting to see, with both memory kits set to the same frequency and timings, the Corsair One actually delivered a higher write speed by about 2,800 megabytes a second. The read speed was almost identical between the two, but the writes in our test system actually lagged behind slightly. As for the SSD as well, we can see very solid speeds from this PCIe Gen 4 SSD. It may not be the absolute fastest Gen 4 SSD that we have ever seen, but it is more than good enough and will definitely get the job done as a boot and games drive for this Corsair One. Moving on to the game testing then, this is what we're all here for and we benchmark 10 titles at 1440p and 4K using the maximum image quality presets in game. To be honest, I have to say the results aren't actually that interesting as the Corsair One is basically matching our GPU test system all the way, so it performs exactly as we expected an i9 and a 3080 to perform. That being said, it is a couple of percent slower than our own GPU test system, but I really don't think you'd actually notice the difference when gaming. In fact, it is on average just 3% behind our GPU test system and delivered great frame rates across the board. The RTX 3080 Ti is one of the fastest graphics cards on the market right now and it shows, so this system would definitely pair very nicely with a high refresh rate 1440p or even 4K gaming monitor. Moving on to our technical testing then, we'll start with CPU thermals. As IQ gives a choice of either the default or extreme fan profiles, I tested both to see what difference they made. For the CPU then, we observed a package temperature of 96C during Cinebench when using the default profile, and that is pretty hot and not far off TJ Maxx. Using the extreme fan profile does reduce this to 88C, which is a bit more like it, though noise levels are much louder, as we will see in just a second. I do think it's important to stress, however, that the default fan profile is absolutely fine for gaming, and this is what the i300 is primarily intended for anyway, and here we can see a peak of 78C during a cyberpunk stress test, and this was reduced by 60 using the extreme mode. As for the GPU then, the thermal performance here, I have to say, really surprised me. Even using the default fan profile, we saw a peak GPU temperature of 69 degrees, and the hotspot was only at 77 degrees, so the liquid cooling is clearly working. Memory temperatures are a bit more of a worry, however, as the default fan profile saw a maximum reading of 100 degrees, and this reduced to 96 degrees when using the extreme profile. Now, this is technically in spec, and the NVIDIA Founders Edition does show similar GDDR6 temperatures, though the Founders cards are notorious for relatively poor memory cooling to begin with. We do just have to say that these thermals are not quite as impressive as the GPU temperatures. You can, however, see why we prefer to use the default fan profile for our testing when looking at the noise levels. The default profile saw the fan operate at around 1550 RPM and it was honestly very easy on the ears. Switching to the extreme profile however, cranked the fan speed up to almost 2000 RPM which is actually as fast as the fan will go and it was raucous. If you're using a gaming headset I don't think it will bother you but if you are setting up the Corsair One in a living room or a shared space you will definitely want to avoid the extreme mode. As for power draw then, the Corsair One drew 253 watts under sustained load in Cinebench R23, and that's about 130 watts less than our own GPU test system, which does make sense thanks to Corsair's strict power limit. When gaming, however, we did see power draw increase to just shy of 530 watts. This is still comfortably within the range of the 750 watt power supply, however, 
and does ensure there's plenty of headroom left over for any particularly demanding titles. Still on the topic of power draw as well, I also use GPU Z to record power draw of the graphics card only. Now, this is done in software, so it's not as accurate as our regular GPU power draw methodology, but it does give us a general idea. Interestingly, we can see that both results from the Corsair 1 show the GPU a little bit below its 350 watt power limit. The desktop 3080 Ti Founders Edition in our test system, for instance, averaged just shy of 448 watts, compared to about 336 watts for the Corsair 1. It's hardly a massive difference, but it is interesting to note. It also appears that those power draw figures are reflected in the operating clock speed of the graphics cards, as the desktop Founders Edition consistently ran the fastest over our 30 minute stress test, hovering around the 1800 MHz mark. The Corsair one using the extreme profile was more like 1775 MHz, with the default profile slower still, fluctuating at around 1740 MHz. Just before wrapping up this review then, I do also want to spend a bit of time talking about pricing. So when this Corsair one first arrived with me, I hopped onto the Corsair website and saw that the specific model I have is priced at a penny under £4,800. Now, for this level of hardware, even if we factor in the unique design and all the costs going towards R&D, I still think this is an extremely high price to pay for this sort of hardware, particularly when you can actually put together a DIY system for less than £3,000 with a near identical spec. On top of that, I also noticed some pricing discrepancies, shall we say, on Corsair's website. Take these two Corsair 1 i300 models, for instance. Both use the i9 12900K and are identical apart from the graphics card, but Corsair is effectively charging £1,000 for the upgrade to an RTX 3080 Ti from an RTX 3080, and that is absolutely ridiculous. Contrast that with these two Corsair 1 A200 models, this time using an AMD 5950X, and here we again found two models which were otherwise identical, except one had a 3080 and the other had a 3080 Ti. This time though, the upgrade only cost £400 to go for a 3080 Ti, so it really did make absolutely no sense. We reached out to Corsair then with our concerns, and after a fair bit of discussion, I noticed on the 22nd of June that the pricing for my model had now dropped to £3,999. We're told this is only a promo price that's going to run until July the 3rd, at which point the pricing is just going to go back up to almost £4,800. Corsair also told us that they tend to buy all their components in bulk, so they would have bought a batch of GPUs at a certain price. So even though GPU prices are nose diving across the board, that is harder for Corsair to reflect in their prices. It just seems to me that the pricing and value of these Corsair One systems does fluctuate quite a lot. And that can make it tricky for customers, especially those who are less tech savvy than the average KitGuru viewer, to know what is a fair price to pay for what spec. The idea of a £1,000 graphics card premium for the 3080 Ti over the 3080 is frankly outrageous. So if you are considering a Corsair 1, I would definitely pay close attention to the pricing. The only other thing I'd add to that is the sample Corsair sent me, I actually think is the worst value skew on their website. 64 gigabytes of DDR5 memory, for instance, is just way overkill for gaming. And even at the current promo price, the RTX 3080 model at £3,499 does appeal to me a lot more, especially as the 3080 Ti is only about 10% faster than the 3080. Wrapping this all together though, I have to say I do like the Corsair 1. I know we had a bit of fun and games with the BIOS situation and the pricing, but the hardware is excellent, and from an engineering perspective, what Corsair has managed to do in such a compact chassis with the unique cooling setup, I have to say is highly impressive. 
The potential difficulty of upgrading the GPU is a concern to me, however, particularly as we're hearing next generation GPUs are not far off. And I'd say they would be very unlikely to work well as a drop in upgrade for the Corsair one. Then again, if you do have the kind of cash to just drop four grand on the Corsair one, you maybe could just sell the system in six months and buy the latest model when they are released with the newest graphics cards. But for the average consumer, if you are looking at the Corsair one, I'd definitely just say to keep a close eye on pricing and make sure you're not paying over the odds for the hardware. Anyway guys, that is gonna do it for this review. So if you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. What do you think of the Corsair One and would you consider buying one? I definitely want to hear from you. You can also subscribe if you haven't already and ding that notification bell. And why not come chat with us over on our Discord server as well, which you can find linked in the description. While you're there, you can also check out our merch store. And if you're feeling particularly generous, you could consider backing us on Patreon. That's it for this one though, guys. I'm Dominic Forkit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.